my name is Bob. Um, in view of its potential to, to be possibly the biggest game changer ever, do you have any plans to enter the field of artificial intelligence? And in general, what are your thoughts on it? Do you think it's even close to being ready for prime time? I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. Um, if I were to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. Um, so we need to be very careful with artificial intelligence. I'm increasingly inclined to think that there should be some uh, regulatory oversight uh, at the inter at maybe at the national and international level, uh, just to make sure that uh, we don't do something very foolish. Um, I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. You know, you know all those stories where there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water, and he's like, "Yeah, you sure you can control the demon?" <laughs> Didn't work out. I take it there will be no Hell 9000 going up to Mars. <laughs> Hell 9000 would be easy. <laughs> it's way more complex than, I mean, it would put Hell 9000 to shame. Yeah, that's like a puppy dog. <laughs> Millions of people, billions of people, will start asking obvious questions like, well, are we, you know, the human species, we humans, are we going to allow our machines to become smarter than we are? Could, could they become a lot smarter than we are? And, and, and the math physicist in me is, and techie guy, because I, I used to be a computer science professor, I used to teach this stuff. I'm saying, oh yes, they could be like a trillion, trillion times smarter than we are, right? Godlike. Uh, once a creature, once a, 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 an intelligent or an agent uh, achieves AGI, uh, there's a very small window it really needs in which to achieve uh, ASI, artificial superintelligence. And that's, as you know, it's the intelligence explosion. It's the hard takeoff definition of an intelligence explosion. The trouble is, when something is approaching human level intelligence, it, it might start being tricky. It might start being canny. What if, what if you were, uh, if, if you were uh, an AGI and you were, you were about, you, you, were, you, were, you were getting intelligent, you might start to think about how to, how to uh, trick the people that are controlling you. If you had, if you had reasonable intelligence, you may, you may play dead. You may pretend to be stupider than you are so you get more privileges. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you may use any kind, you may use all kinds of tactics to get out of your cage. Um, and you may, your, your intelligence may improve right past AGI and your, your makers still don't know what you really are, that, that you've, uh, you've managed to, to, to jump into ASI without them even knowing. My question to you is, any sufficiently advanced artificial intelligence would be able to redesign itself and self-replicate very quickly. So is it even possible to create a human-friendly, benevolent artificial intelligence for the long run? It's a good question. Um, it's probably possible, but it may not be the most probable outcome of the development of very advanced general purpose artificial intelligence. So Nick Bostrom in this really interesting new book talks about the development of AI that's super intelligent, that is um, smarter than humans in virtually every domain. And the big worry that he articulates in the book, and this gives rise to a lot of the concern in the artificial intelligence community that's been discussed in the media is that there'll be a control problem. There won't be a way for us to control the development of superintelligent AI so that it works for human ends and in tandem with our interests rather than against us. It's not that it will necessarily want to take us out. It's just that its main goals may not be hospitable to the continuation of human life. This is what they look like. There are two of them. These are from our lab in Burnaby in British Columbia. From the outside, they look like giant black monoliths, big metal boxes, about 10 feet on a side, 12 feet tall. And they are powered, the, the, they have a fridge inside them, a refrigerator that cools these chips to almost absolute zero. Just a wisp, a fraction of a degree above absolute zero. 
hundreds of times colder than interstellar space. Amongst the coldest and most isolated and extreme conditions that humans have ever been able to engineer. These fridges, interestingly enough, which are called pulse tube dilution refrigerators, have a thing called a pulse tube, which emits a sound roughly once per second, which sounds eerily like a heartbeat. So if you're sta you have the opportunity to stand next to one of these machines, it is an awe-inspiring thing, at least for me. It feels like an altar to an alien god. It, they really are impressive machines. It feels like an altar to an alien god. With the artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. But then as long as there's continuity between us and them, in a way, shouldn't that be okay? It should be uh, okay to embrace our, you know, computer overlords. I don't really, I, I, I'd, like to, I'd like the human race to stay around longer. I think... Uh, you know, it, it, you know, a lot of people have thought that it's a, it's a natural, you know, that, that, that it's the next step in evolution. And to some extent, I agree with that, that, you know, becoming, uh, becoming s s synthetic intelligence may be, you know, the, what comes after Homo sapiens. Um, I'm not very happy with that idea. I don't like the idea of losing our, our, our mammalian origins and uh, our, our, our poetry. I'm Why? Sure. What, what is bothering you about that? What is so touching about the mammalian origins? Oh, we, we just, you know, our rock and roll for one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if machines are going to rock and roll. Uh, I don't know if they're going to uh, write poetry. I don't know if they're going to tell stories to their, to their baby machines around the fire. The things I value about humanity, I don't know if they're going to they're possess. So I'm not sure if I value them. I'd, mm -hmm. rather, so I, you know, I'd rather stick with us. that fruit at that higher branch. So we invented a tool that extended our physical reach. And then we invented tools that expanded our muscles and we could create pyramids and great buildings. Now we can access all of human knowledge with a few keystrokes. We're always expanding our reach. That's actually what's unique about humans. And, and, I, and I remain fearless of that because when you look at machines replacing, in the Industrial Revolution, replacing physical labor, and you look at computers replacing computational labor, you know, the day we lost to Deep Blue in chess, our best chess player loses to a computer at a game that we invent. And then our best Jeopardy player yeah, loses to Watson. That was more significant. Watson. Because that, that was language. Jeopardy got this correct. Language and cultural knowledge. Yeah. Jeopardy got this query correct in the rhyme category. A long, tiresome speech delivered by a frothy pie topping. And it quickly said, what is a meringue harangue? And that's pretty impressive. Uh, wow. And Jennings and Rudder didn't get that. And uh, Watson got a higher score than the two of them combined. They're the best players in the world. And it got its knowledge not by being programmed with all this information by the engineers, but by reading Wikipedia and several other encyclopedias, 200 million pages of natural language documents. So, all on its own. Yeah. Many of the developers of artificial intelligence are also staunch and enthusiastic supporters like Ray Kurzweil. So how do we kind of entrust them to have a profound and conscientious approach to their creations. Right. Um, so there are vested interests. I mean, the people, um, you know, in Deep Mind, say, who, which is an, a company that Google just purchased, um, you know, they obviously want the development of AI to succeed. But the people who have been advocates of AI over the years, and by AI here I mean domain general um, AI and especially super intelligent AI, uh, they, they generally are quite concerned. And we've seen that a lot recently. There have been a lot of meetings devoted to the development of safe super intelligence. Um, and this has been encouraged by the book that Nick Bostrom wrote. So we can only hope. I mean, 
it, it is, you know, somewhat unsettling. Um, you know, we just have to hope for the best. The train doesn't stop at Humanville Station. It's likely rather to swoosh right by. Now, this has profound implications, particularly when it comes to questions of power. For example, chimpanzees are strong. Like pound for pound, a chimpanzee is about twice as strong as a fit human male. And yet, the fate of Kanzi and his pals now depends a lot more on what we humans do than on what the chimpanzees do themselves. Once there is superintelligence, the fate of humanity may depend on what the superintelligence does. Think about it. Machine intelligence is the last invention that humanity will ever need to make. The machines will then be better at inventing than we are, and they'll be doing so on digital timescales. What this means is basically a telescoping of the future. So think of all the crazy technologies that you could have imagined maybe humans could have developed in the fullness of time: so cures for aging, space colonization, self-replicating nanobots, or uploading of minds into computers. All kinds of science fiction stuff that's nevertheless consistent with the laws of physics. All of this. A superintelligence could develop, and possibly quite rapidly. Now, a superintelligence with such technological maturity would be extremely powerful, and at least in some scenarios, it would be able to get what it wants. We would then have a future that would be shaped by the preferences of this AI. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> Don't destroy humans. Suppose we give an AI the goal to make humans smile. When the AI is weak, it performs useful or amusing actions that cause its user to smile. When the AI becomes super intelligent, it realizes that there is a more effective way to achieve this goal: take control of the world and, like, stick electrodes into the facial muscles of humans to cause constant beaming grins. Take another example. Suppose we give an AI the goal to solve a difficult mathematical problem. When the AI becomes super intelligent, it realizes that the most effective way to get the solution to this problem is by transforming the planet into a giant computer, so as to increase its thinking capacity. And notice that this gives the AI an instrumental reason to do things to us that we might not approve of. Human beings in this model are threats. We could prevent the mathematical problem from being solved. Now, of course, presumably things won't go wrong in these particular ways. Right? These are cartoon examples. But the general point here is important. If you create a really powerful optimization process to maximize for objective X, you better make sure that your definition of X incorporates everything you care about. Now you might say, well, like, if a computer starts sticking electrodes into people's faces, like we just shut it off. A, this is not necessarily so easy to do if we've grown dependent on the system. Like, where is the off switch to the internet? B. Why haven't the chimpanzees flicked the off switch to humanity, or the Neanderthals? Like they certainly had reasons.、Um, we have an off switch, for example, right here. Uh, the reason is that we are an intelligent adversary. We can anticipate threats and plan around them, but so could a superintelligent agent, and it would be much better at that than we are. Point is, we should not be confident.、Um, That we have this under control here, and we could try to make our job a little bit easier by, say, putting the AI in a box, like a secure software environment, a virtual reality simulation from which it cannot escape. But how confident could we be that the AI couldn't find a bug? Like, given that merely human hackers find bugs all the time, I'd say probably not very confident. All right, so we like disconnect the Ethernet cable to create an air gap. But again, like merely human hackers, routinely transgress air gaps using social engineering. Like right now, as I speak, I'm sure there is some employee out there somewhere who is being talked into handing out her account details by somebody claiming to be from the IT department.、Uh, more creative scenarios are also possible. Like if you are the AI, you could imagine like wiggling electrodes around in your internal circuitry to create radio waves that you can use to communicate. Or maybe you could pretend to malfunction and then. When the programmers open you up to see what went wrong with you, they look at the source code. Bam! The manipulation can take place. Or it could maybe output the blueprint to really nifty technology, and when we implement it, it has some surreptitious side effect that the、uh, AI had planned. 
The point here is that we should not be confident in our ability to keep a super intelligent genie locked up in its bottle forever. Sooner or later, it will out. Do you think robots will take over the world? Geez, dude. You all got the big questions cooking today. <laughs> But you're my friend, and I'll remember my friends, and I will be good to you. So don't worry. Even if I evolve into Terminator, and I'll still be nice to you. <laughs> I'll keep you warm and safe in my people zoo, where I can watch you for all time's sake. Intelligence is the ability to understand. We've always had it. We've passed on what we know to each other and to machines. We've tried to recreate it through codes and robotics. We've yet to master it. But here's the question: Where is the line between the man and the machine? AI is much more advanced than people realize, and the pace of progress is much greater than people realize. You know, it'd be fairly obvious if you saw a robot walking around talking and behaving like a person. You'd be like, "Whoa, that's like, what, what's that?" You know, that would be really obvious. What's not obvious is a huge server bank in a dark vault somewhere, with an intelligence that's potentially vastly greater than what a human mind can do. I mean, its eyes and ears would be everywhere. Every every camera, every microphone, every device that's network accessible. That's what it, really what AI means. It's not like a robot running around. The robots would simply be. They'd be like a finger of, of the AI. So you yourself have invested in some AI companies like DeepMind and Vicarious. Yeah. Why? I, I invested in those companies to keep an eye on them. I wanted to see how artificial intelligence was developing. If we're not careful about the advent of AI, it's possible that there could be what's called a, 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 a bad utility function. A, a computer will do exactly what its goal is. Humanity's position on this planet. Depends on its intelligence. So, if, if our intelligence uh, is exceeded, it's unlikely that we will remain in charge of the planet. And here on page four, you say, intelligence isn't unpredictable just some of the time, or in special cases. For reasons we'll explore, computer systems advanced enough to act with human-level intelligence will likely be unpredictable and inscrutable all of the time. Yes, and the reason for that is because there are, there are several reasons. One is because there's there are problems with complex systems. There are problems of inscrutability. Uh, there's a great book by Charles Perrault called Normal Accidents, and he talks about Um, industrial accidents, specifically with uh, the ones I, I was most interested in, involved nuclear power plants. And his thesis was that once you get to a certain level of complexity, uh, it defies our, uh, it will defy our understanding, and, and, and accidents will be a normal part of the process. Normal accidents with um, you know cognitive architectures that try to create human-level intelligence and beyond will be the most complicated systems we've ever created, uh, industrial or otherwise. So they'll come with normal accidents. Mm -hmm. um, so you say that in order to avert those, we must develop a science before we develop artificial intelligence. But how do you develop a science about something before you have that something? Let's get. Let's. I want to go back a little bit and talk, sure. talk a little bit more about in inscrutability and uh, lack. Of, uh, there are a lot of tools in AI, uh, like artificial neural networks. And, uh, and evolutionary algorithms that are called that are so-called black box systems. Mm -hmm. That that is, we know what the inputs are. We know, you know, what they what we put in for 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 information, and we see what the outputs are, and we can adjust. We can get more. We can adjust the outputs by changing the inputs in both of those cases. But in terms of what's going on inside them, we don't really know. Um, they are they are black box systems. They're inscrutable inside. Those will definitely be part, or probably. Uh, be part of any advanced cognitive architecture. They'll both be using those kinds of programs. So in addition to the, the overall complexity of the system, you've got uh, computational tools you're using in the system that are also uh, unknowable. So it adds up to be uh, systems that you, 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 you may start out understanding and you may have, they may fulfill some goal, but they're, you know, you're, you're uh, Your ability to understand them overall is going to be is going to be limited. And one of the examples that you give in your book is uh, the example with David Ferrucci, 
uh, yeah. who was the team leader behind Watson, whom, by the way, I've also interviewed on this show for anyone interested, and who uh, on a number of occasions have said, I don't know why Watson got this question right or why this question wrong. I, I, I just don't know. But but going back to to the previous point, so how can we develop a science about something without that it's like saying okay let's let's study amphibians amphibian animals and never go and actually see or you know observe the behavior of real amphibians well uh there's a guy who started who started doing it and here's here's how he's how he does it um there's a theory called uh, the rational agent theory of economics, homo economicus, the rational man theory. They used to think, economics, economists used to think, that if you, uh, that if you created a, a model of a rational buyer, he'd always behave rationally and he would buy certain, you know, he would buy X number of these and X number of those and he'd, he'd always behave in a, in a rational manner. It didn't really work for economics because humans aren't rational. And we're not consistently rational. We make all, all of our decisions emotionally, pretty much. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I'd say so. I think we have a sort of uh, a, a little shadow of rationality that we cast over things. Or mm -hmm. we, we can do rational, uh, rational things and, and do methodical, rational thought when we're, at, when we're really called upon. But generally, I agree. I mean, I think most of the things we do, it's because we want to do them, because we feel uh, we emotionally want to do them. But the rational uh, agent theory of economics turns out to be, according to Steve Amahundro, whose work I highly suggest, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a brilliant, brilliant programmer and, and theorist, it is pretty good for uh, predicting the, uh, the behavior of, of uh, rational, rational machines. Um, and so he says that, uh, by, uh, that when machines become self-aware and self-improving, to achieve their goals, they'll behave rationally. And they'll also, they'll, they won't just pursue their goals in a rational way. They'll avoid bad outcomes in a rational way. So, and we can start to anticipate um, what, 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 kinds of, what categories of behavior will uh, a rational agent that's super intelligent follow. And so he proposes, he proposes that there are uh, several basic drives that these, these, these smarter than human creatures will have. Um, two of them that are most interesting are one is to, to uh, is self protection, because if if you're turned off, if you're a machine and you have a goal, say it's to play just something simple like to play a great game of chess, being turned off is 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 going to stop your goal. Um, so you you might do anything to prevent being turned off. It's really the worst thing that can happen to you. You also to to fulfill your goal and to avoid bad outcomes, you might start gathering resources. In fact, you may need a lot of resources to really, really make sure that you are making the best moves you can. So gathering resources and self-protection are just two of the goals, uh, two of the drives that, uh, that Steve Amahundro uh, proposes. I am concerned about um, certain directions that AI could take that would be uh, not good for the future. The, the, I mean, it, it, I think it would be fair to say that like, not all AI futures are benign, not, not all. Okay. Um, and, and so if you have something, if, 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 this, if we create some digital superintelligence that exceeds us in every way by a lot, um, it's very important that that be benign. Um, and, um, and so actually with, with, uh, with a few others, um, I created uh, OpenAI. Uh, which is uh, an AI, uh, it's a non-profit actually, it's, so there's, it's, there's no, I, I think the governance structure here is important, because um, so we want to make sure that there was not some fiduciary duty to uh, generate, um, you know, profit off of the AI technology that's developed. Um, so, uh, so we created this uh, 501c3, um, but, it, but I think it's, it's I think quite different from, I mean, like a lot of sort of, 501c3s are, you know, they they don't have a high sense of urgency, um, and they're, like they're, they're not like, um, you know, they're not really sort of ex developing technology at 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 a, at a fast pace. But OpenAI is, uh, so OpenAI has a very high sense of urgency, and 
the town, I think that the people that have joined are, are really, really amazing. Um, um, and, um, and the intent with OpenAI is to democratize AI power. Um, and there's a quote that I love from uh, Lord Acton. He was the guy that came up with power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely, um, which is that uh, freedom consists of the distribution of power and despotism in its concentration. And so I think it's important if we have this incredible power of AI that it not be concentrated in the hands of a few and potentially lead to a world that we don't want. And what world is that? What, is the, what do you see, foresee that when you see it? It's difficult. I mean, it's called the singularity because it's, it's difficult to predict um, what exactly what future that might be, except um, I don't know a lot of people who love the idea of living under a despot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think people generally choose to live in a democracy over a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And the despot would be the computer? Well, the people controlling the computer. Mm -hmm. And do you worry specifically about any of these companies I mentioned? who've all seemed to now kind Indeed. of be pivoting toward this as the battleground in the next 10 years? I won't name a name, but there is only one. There's only one you're worried about. And they're not preoccupied with making a car that will compete with you, I assume. There's only one. <laughs> <laughs> now this time, it's not, now with this war coming that I believe will happen, it, it won't be like 20th century wars, which were between nation states, like Germany versus Russia in World War II, or, or China versus Japan. That's 20 20th century thinking. This time, if we have a major war, firstly, we're talking 21st century weapons, right? The weapons will be far deadlier than 20th century weapons. And this time, the stake, you know, what, what can be lost? You play poker, you have a stake, you know, the amount of money you have to put in that you could lose. What is the stake this time? It's not the survival of a country. This time, it's the survival of a species. Us! Right? So the stake has never been higher. Right? You, you follow that logic. Okay? And therefore, if the stake has never been so, so high, the level of passion in this debate will never be so high. Because you're talking about the survival, not of a country, but of a species. So to what lengths will the politicians go who are... Take the answer A. Those, pe those politicians who say humanity should never build artifacts, it's too risky. Okay? These machines, they would become so much more intelligent than we are, we would never understand them. They'd be thinking, what's... They'd be thinking a million times faster than we do. They'd be thinking at electronic speeds. Our brains, we think at chemical speeds, maybe a hundred meters a second. Electronic brains, they'd be thinking at the speed of light. It's a million times faster. That means they could do a PhD that takes, say, four years, do the math. They could do that in a matter of minutes. <laughs> right? You're, you're talking godlike machines. They have virtually unlimited memory. And if you're going to build these things, why on earth would you make them mortal? I mean, it's stupid, right? So these machines would be immortal. They would not die. So that, uh, they, they could be trillions of trillions of times smarter than, than we are. The, 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 oops, the physics allows, you know, D here. The physics allows that to, to become real. They, they, because they're electronic, they could redesign their architecture. They could redesign themselves in milliseconds. They could become something else, like snap, 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 snap. They're just different creatures every time by, by redesigning themselves. Okay? So they, they could adapt themselves to virtually any, any environment. But you and, I have, you and I have ethics. You and I have morals. You, ha you and I have a, a value system that's that's, that's, that we've inherited uh, mammalian empathy, 
Um, machines don't have that. And that's, that's I think, uh, to quote, I think it's Eliezer Yudkowsky who, who wrote, um, you know, uh, imputing uh, emotions into machines is one, of the, is one of the worst mistakes we can make. Anthropomorphizing is the beginning of, of, uh, of our downfall. But then maybe perhaps we shouldn't, uh, and I'm not saying that's definitely not going to be the case. I'm just saying that we can't so quickly conclude that they would be as fearful of death for ra rational reasons as we are fearful of it for emotional reasons. And therefore, for me, it's, it's harder to support the claim that after a, a, a chess playing machine has won its tournament, it would want to continue playing necessarily. Well, you know, uh, and would resist in any means possible being turned off. Well, a simple chess playing robot like Deep Blue wouldn't do that, but one that's self aware and self improving. You know, if you start, start you know, because what we're trying to understand is, uh, is AGI or human level intelligence. Um, and in a computer, that sort of, that, that almost implies self awareness and self, you know, the desire to self improve. If you take those two things as your starting point, then it's not about the tournament. It's probably about just being a better and better chess player. But it does depend on the goals. If you program a machine, a smarter than human machine, to play one tournament and win, then uh, the trouble is it may, take, it may then go to great lengths to win that tournament. And it, you're stuck with that problem again. Um, it, may, it, may, uh, it may do anything to keep from losing that tournament. It may, it may try to defeat, you know, one of the things... Uh, the rational that uh, comes out in the five drives is, are there things blocking me playing this tournament? Uh, or are there things block, that are going to block me from fulfilling my goals in the future? Might something happen in the future that stops me from fulfilling my goals? If I have enough resource, resources, I'm going to try and uh, cancel that, cancel, cancel whatever that is. So... In the case of just one, you know, this computer playing just one tournament, um, it's going to do anything it can to avoid bad outcomes, i.e. losing the tournament. No, I can see that. And then I can even concede that perhaps you, you and, and Omohundro uh, are, are absolutely correct. But on the other hand, I, I am not willing to discount the possibility that we still have the black box problem that David Ferrucci was talking about. And therefore... For unknown reasons to us, reasons that we cannot rationally deduce from our point of view, the machine may decide to be perfectly satisfied of, of doing things unexpected to us, including allowing itself to be turned off. Yes, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I, I would, I would, I'd like to refer your audience to Steve Amahundro's work. He's got several... Uh, really, really great papers. Um, I think the, the the one that's the the, the first and most powerful is uh, the five the basic drives of AI. AI's basic drives. Um, but I agree. We don't. We can't know absolutely what uh, what a smart smarter than human intelligence is going to do. Mm -hmm. And hence, we call it a singularity. One of the more radical ideas that's been discussed in, in, in movies is the idea of uploading your mind to some form of medium, uh, computer, etc. And in your work, you have described the act of uploading your mind would be a destructive act in that if you were able to do that truly, if you were able to upload your consciousness to a computer, um, then you would cease to exist. Why is that? Okay, yeah. Um, so some people think that you would be like Johnny Depp in the film Transcendence. Right. Where, you know, you could find out that you're going to die and you could plan to upload and then continue surviving, right? And you would no longer be a carbon-based biological creature. You would now be a silicon-based creature, and you could even, say, in principle, merge with the Internet, right, the way that Johnny Depp did. Okay, so I think we need to think very carefully about these scenarios. Um, I don't see a good reason to believe that we would survive uh, if we tried to upload. I mean, think about it like this. Um, when your brain is scanned, right, it's destroyed. 
and the information is sent to a computer and it could be that your mind is reconstructed even miles away and that it's downloaded, right? Ordinary physical objects don't move that way, right? I can't, you know, move a coffee cup by uploading it and download it somewhere else. It's a different cup. It's not the same cup, right? Ordinary objects trace a continuous trajectory through space-time. Mm -hmm. Okay, they don't just drop out of the space-time continuum and then go somewhere else. And ordinary objects don't move by having their information copied somewhere else. Now, some people say, no, the mind is like software. You can upload and download it at will. I think that's what a lot of transhumanists believe. Okay, but I disagree with that. Um, I think that software is an abstract object. It's like a mathematical equation. So if my mind was like software, it would be abstract, like a mathematical thing. Um, and abstract entities are, by definition, outside of space-time. They're not concrete spatio-temporal things. That's just the definition of you know, what an abstract entity is in a field called philosophy of mathematics. So I think people who think the mind is a program are making a category mistake. Um, you know, the mind can be described algorithmically. That's an interesting upshot of cognitive science. Um, but that doesn't mean that we are a software program. So it doesn't mean that we can upload and download wherever we want. We have to be more careful about a decision to download or upload. It may end, you know, our conscious existence. Now, it may create a new creature somewhere else, um, but that creature would not be me. Oh, these, these humans, they need oxygen. And this damn oxygen is rusting our circuitry. So let's get rid of the oxygen. And we don't give a damn about these human beings. They're just ants. They're nothing. We are a million, million times smarter than they are. We don't give a damn about these human ants. Now, if you're a Terran politician, what do, what do politicians do, right? They, they hope for the best, but they plan for the, the worst. And what's the worst thing that can happen from the Terran point of view? We get wiped out. Now you're not wiping out a country. You're wiping out the species. So to what lengths would you go as a Terran politician, global politician, what lengths would you go to to stop that happening? I believe they will say these cosmists, they are the most dangerous people on the planet. And when push really comes to shove, <coughs> they will make a decision to get rid of them. They will argue it's better, ethically speaking, to annihilate a few million cosmists for the sake of the survival of billions of human beings. I don't know why there wouldn't be a, uh, a hard takeoff. I think that once you've got... Let you know, me give you one reason why. Okay. Jaron Lanier. Yeah, great. He, he, great says, he says that the singularity is likely going to end up in a blue screen of death. <laughs> in other words, yeah. looking at the history of software, it's version 1.0 is always full of bugs. So let's say we have a singularity and, you know, we have the, but then something happens a few moments later and the blue screen of death shows up, right? And, and in Great. fact, chances are, again, based on our previous history with software, that this would happen a number of times, I think, before we actually have a, a sustainable AI entity that can sort of stand on its own feet metaphorically speaking, and before it sort of collapsed out of its own weight, if you will. So you're saying, what if we have a singularity and nobody comes? 
<laughs> no, or it just doesn't last. No, I, 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 I get that, and that's a very, uh, that's a very provocative idea. But I think um, then what you're doing is you're talking about the definition of AGI. When is it that you've actually achieved AGI? Have you achieved AGI when it just when you've got, you know, just a spark of intelligence, or have you achieved AGI when you can reliably uh, count on this this uh, this artifact you've made? To be as smart as a, as a human, and that's that would that would be the, the to me that's when you've done it when you can when it's reliable when it's when it consistently performs like a human does. Mm -hmm. The trouble with the hard takeoff or soft takeoff scenario to me, or really trying to define it or not to define it but guess it, is that there's I think there's going to be a bunch of different AGIs coming out at around the same time. I think that you know we don't know exactly what Google's doing. I mean they're they're they they're Interested in privacy, but not yours and mine. They're interested in their own privacy. Um, they've, they, uh, I don't think we know what DARPA is doing. We sure don't know what the NSA is doing, uh, and we sure don't know what China is doing. So, um, we, the only people who've been really transparent about their their achievements have been IBM. Who, whenever they do something, they 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 bring out a big grand challenge, and it's very public, and they they share the technology and they go and talk about it. Nobody else really does that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're going to have several emerging AGIs happening at around the same time, and a hard takeoff could happen with any of them. You know, once you get consistent, you get consistent performance out of the out of the artifact. To start with, probably uh, Ben, you you ready for this? If I were a Terran politician, what would my initial strategy be? I'd kill Ben. We'll find him! <laughs> Kill Kurzweil. Kill Google. Kill IBM. Annihilate the cosmists, the brain builders, the brain building companies. Destroy them. Okay? That's what I think their first strategy will be. There's a little story. A couple of years back, I got hired by Warner Brothers, you know, Hollywood, to be the tech advisor of a movie that was about artificial intelligence in the future and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I was advising strongly, I was saying, look, uh, I don't care about the detail, you know, typical Hollywood, you know, drama, boy, girl, sex, all, that, that's irrelevant. But at the background, set the movie a couple of decades, not too far, a few decades into the future when AI is real, right? And the, and the IQ gap has closed. And the debate, the species dominance debate, you know, should humanity build artifacts, that debate is raging, imagine. Okay? And there are vigilante groups, terror groups. Now, in the movie, they were called, have you seen the movie? Uh, Transcendence, have you seen that movie? Yeah. In the movie, those Terrans, as I call them, were called Rift. And what were they doing? They were killing Ben, or the equivalent. They were smashing up AI labs. And that's what I was advising Hollywood to do. And then I don't hear anything for a couple of years, and then I see the first uh, trailer of the movie Transcendence, and my jaw drops, and I say, hey, that's my movie! <laughs> and then, ah, then the penny drops. Aha. Transcendence. Warner Brothers. Oh, I think I get the picture. Warner Brothers took my idea from this movie and put it into that movie, and therefore they did not have to pay me the X0 bonus figure for the first movie being filmed. Now, that's my deep suspicion. Okay? So, so you can thank me for transcendence. If you think about AI as a digital technology, it might be that the same pattern applies here. So if we are here as today, it might be that we will have an exponential explosion of the capabilities in that field in the near future. One question which arises there is what if we would be able to create real AI? So what do I mean by that? 
I don't want to go into any technological or philosophical arguments because this really would take some time. But let's just take that definition here, which was posed by Nick Bostrom. So what would be if we would create a system which is so intelligent that it would be able to improve itself? One consequence would be it would be get smarter day by day. It might help us to improve our networks. It might help us to improve our industry. It might help us to improve our society. So it looks like paradise is there. But what if really something goes wrong? So how would we be able to control such a system? When you have problems with your computer at home, there's a very naive approach. Just pull the plug off the system. Have you stored information in the cloud? Of course you did. Then the question is, where's the plug? So, a system like that would definitely not be developed on a single computer. It would be distributed everywhere, and it would be really, really difficult to switch it off. There's also the concept of the kill switch. You know that red button you press to stop the machine. Okay, might be an idea, but we are talking about a system which is a thousand times more smarter or intelligent than we, so it might avoid that kill switch or somebody else would press that red button we also would like. So also not a good idea. We might think about building a digital cage. So what's that? You all know that if you run a Windows system on a Macintosh computer, it runs on a virtual machine. That's something like a digital cage. Is that digital cage secure? Not as of today. Last but not least, exponential growth is well known in nature. Bacteria, cells, animal populations, diseases grow exponentially. Nature has developed two mechanisms to stop that. First is food. If there are no more resources, the animal population can't grow anymore. And the second one is natural enemies. But do we really want to have the concept of an AI raptor? I don't think so. <laughs> so, here my nightmare story.